Hello, everyone. It's 1 p.m. Eastern, and that means it's time to begin our 58th, can you believe that, 58th Kokoros Weather Talk webinar. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Henry Regis. Running the technical side of our program is our very own Noah Newman. We're coming to you live from the Colorado Climate Center here at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado, on what has turned out to be a bright, sunny day. We've had rain for the last couple days, and it's nice to see that sunshine out there again. Well, we'll be recording today's broadcast for future viewing. In fact, all of our past webinars are viewable via the Kokoros website. So if you have a one that you haven't seen yet, just uh, click on the website, and uh, you can watch those in their entirety. Finally, all of our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by generous donations from listeners like you, and we really appreciate your support here. Well, today we'll find out about a society that's been around for almost 100 years now, and it certainly is a, the granddaddy of all the weather organizations out there. So today's topic is, what is the American Meteorological Society and why is it important to you? With us today is Keith Sider, a longtime friend of Kokoros, and he's a man I grew to highly respect while I worked at my previous job at AMS in Boston back about 12 years ago. Keith is the executive director of the AMS and has been in that role for almost 13 years now. He has served on the AMS staff in other capacities also there since 1991. Before joining the AMS, Keith was on the faculty at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. He earned his undergraduate degree in meteorology at Penn State University and a doctorate in geophysical sciences at the University of Chicago. Uh, Keith is a Cubs fan, and he was very, I'm sure, very happy to see the results of last year's World Series. And Keith has a dog at home named Charney, uh, so uh, it's neat. Uh, he can tell you who Charney is later on, uh, or well, 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 we'll leave it up to him. Well, welcome, Keith. It's great to have you with us on our broadcast today. Oh, thanks. It's nice to be here. And, and I've got a question for you. We we usually ask a lot of our our uh, presenters, when did you know that you wanted to become a meteorologist? Was there an event? What what started things off? Uh, well, you know, this is something that uh, I wanted to do since I was a little kid. Um, I think it probably goes back to uh, growing up in the Midwest uh, where there was a lot of severe weather. Uh, I remember many uh, times being stuck in the basement um, uh, with no electricity as uh, tornado warnings were going around uh, near us. and. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, some of my family's uh, property, uh, not my immediate family, but uh, uncles and aunts uh, had uh, tornado damage in some of their homes um, uh, when I was quite young, and I know that made a huge impression on me. Uh, so it's really been since I was probably six or seven uh, that I thought meteorology was something that I wanted to do. And, uh, and that uh, conviction just grew over time as I learned more about the science uh, and uh, really um, started to understand uh, how the atmosphere worked and and what it uh, what it meant to be a meteorologist. Uh, it just became a, a lifelong passion for me. That's pretty neat. Yeah, I know most of us out there who are meteorologists can relate somewhere in our childhood. There's something that some event or something that kind of got us into the field, and it's it's one of those neat fields where th that seems to be the case. So. Uh, well, th thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm going to turn the controls over to you now, and uh, why don't uh, you, you begin, and then we'll take questions afterwards. Thanks. Terrific. I will just uh, uh, jump right in here uh, and tell you a little bit about um, uh, AMS. Um, this um, the first slide is, uh, is, uh, gives the mission statement for the society, and uh, as you can see, it talks about um, uh, advancing the atmospheric and related sciences, and by that we mean uh, a whole range of science that's related to the atmosphere. So not just meteorology, but also oceanography, hydrology, uh, we get into space weather issues, uh, all sorts of things that have a connection to the atmosphere in one way or another, or a connection to climate. And so uh, we really cover quite a wide range of, of topics, even though meteorological uh, is, is sort of the core uh, science for us. Uh, it really goes beyond just that. Uh, the other thing is about the, the mission that's uh, important, I think, is that the, um, uh, those last few words about doing these things for the benefit of society. Uh, so we really see our mission 
as um, making sure that the science moves forward because we know that that science is important to humanity. The, the work that our community does, um, uh, protecting life and property, um, providing a forecasts that can be useful for your economy, all of those sorts of things really uh, fundamentally uh, are, are, are ways that, um, that our science and our profession uh, serves the, the broader uh, society. Uh, I do want to point out the AMS seal that's here, and uh, if you can kind of see the, the pointer going around here. Um, this has been our logo since the society was formed in 1919, and, uh, and it's actually quite a neat uh, image. Uh, it has clouds and rain and those sorts of things, but one of the questions that uh, I think you guys uh, were asked to look at was uh, was what else is in the seal. And if you look at this carefully, you can see that the clouds kind of outline North America. You can kind of see Alaska and the California coast going down to Mexico and Florida there. Uh, and even South America shows up in the uh, in the shadows here. So uh, as a an organization that was um, uh, that was founded to to really serve the American uh, continent, um, having the Americas uh, show up, uh, in this image really is, is kind of a slick thing that um, once you see it, it, it kind of jumps out at you, but uh, many meteorologists have um, been associated with the AMS for many years and never noticed those uh, continents that were actually part of the AMS seal. Uh, I mentioned here that we are the, the premier scientific and professional society. Um, Henry was right that uh, we really are sort of the, the, the granddaddy in some sense uh, and, and really are respected around the world as being uh, really uh, one of the key organizations uh, serving this profession. But it really it's more than just that. And I wanted to spend some time talking about what we actually do. Uh, and so we think of ourselves as strengthening the weather, water, and climate community and, and really uh, think in terms of taking the professionals and the scientists that are in our community uh, and providing services uh, to them that uh, allow them to, to be better at their jobs, allow the science to be used uh, more effectively. And, and we do that by doing a variety of things. Uh, first, we publish scientific journals. Uh, there are uh, 10 journals listed here uh, that are, uh, again, sort of the leading journals in their fields in the world. Uh, the Journal of Climate uh, is, is one of the locations where some of the most important climate research uh, is published um, every year. Uh, the uh, uh, Journal of Month Journal Monthly Weather Review is where an awful lot of uh, the cutting edge research on storm systems and and how we understand how those those uh, systems work uh, gets published. There's the whole range of things, including physical oceanography, uh, hydrology, uh, all sorts of topics that are covered in these journals. Um, this really provides uh, one of the most fundamental ways in which uh, we can um, uh, promote the science and, and allow the, the research that's being done to get into other scientists' hands uh, around the world so that their science can be improved through seeing what other scientists are doing. So it's, uh, it's, it's a fundamental part of, of our mission. It's a fundamental part of what we do. Um, and it's, um, uh, as I say, it's, it's one of the things we've been doing pretty much since the outset uh, for almost 100 years now. Uh, we publish about 35,000 pages of research a year, so there's quite a lot of, um, of work that's being published in these journals, and they really, um, as I say, are, are well respected around the world. Uh, we also publish uh, something that's more like a magazine. It's, it's, uh, it's about half magazine, half journal. Uh, and it's called the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. It is our, our fundamental uh, member magazine. So it has information uh, for members. It has news, book reviews, uh, obituaries uh, for um, prominent members who have died, all the kinds of things you think of uh, for a membership organization to have as its magazine. Um, but in addition to that, it also includes peer-reviewed scientific research, uh, and it is uh, uh, almost every year, one of the top two or three uh, journals uh, in the world covering our field. Uh, so it, it is a, a very important publication in terms of the science that it publishes, uh, as well as being an important publication for our members to provide them information about things happening in the field. So it's, uh, there's a bunch of covers here on this slide that, that kind of give you a sense of, of the sorts of things that are, that are cover stories uh, for the organization. Uh, and again, it's really um, uh, quite a fun um, uh, publication for those of us in the field. Keith, I want to jump in real quick. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you look there, the second one over there with the picture of the globe, we had our Kokoros um, article in there. So for you folks out there, 
that. It's <clears throat> excuse me, the October issue last year. If you get a chance, it was a really nice. Uh, they did a really nice job with that, and so we really appreciate that. But uh, even Kokoros has appeared in in BAMs. Absolutely. So <laughs> and so, yeah, it is. It does cover those sorts of uh, those sorts of issues across the field, though. Um, we also put on conferences when uh, when Henry worked uh, at AMS. He was uh, part of the group that uh, helped. Um, uh, organize and and sponsor the conferences uh, each year. Um, the the big one each year is uh, typically in January. That's our annual meeting uh, that brings over four thousand folks uh, to uh, whatever location we have uh, the, the meeting at that year. That does move around the country uh, each year, so it's in different places each year. Uh, so that one has about twenty scientific conferences, uh, all bundled together uh, under a, a single venue, as well as an exhibits program and lots of other things that are happening. A really kind of um, a high energy meeting uh, for about a week that, um, as I say, brings together uh, about 4,000, well, more than 4,000 uh, scientists and, and professionals from within our community. Uh, we also do smaller meetings over the course of the year. So there will be about a dozen other conferences uh, that happen uh, outside the annual meeting uh, that can have anywhere from 100 to maybe four or 500 uh, attendees. Uh, those happen, again, all over the country and in some cases in other countries. Uh, we, we are an international organization, and so we do have meetings that, um, that go beyond uh, the borders of the U.S. Um, those smaller meetings uh, tend to focus on a particular subdiscipline, and so there will be a specific meeting on radar meteorology, and there will be a specific meeting on satellite meteorology. Uh, we have a broadcast um, uh, meteorology conference each year for the folks who are um, uh, broadcasters uh, in the field. Uh, so each of those meetings, as I say, is is a smaller meeting, very focused on on just the uh, either the science or the uh, the professional subdiscipline uh, that that meeting covers. Uh, again, very high energy. Um, uh, it's it's uh, a lot of fun to get uh, a group of a, a few hundred people together uh, who all have the same interests, who all care about the same things, um, and uh, and really just talking about the weather for for a week straight is uh, is really. Uh, just a, a, a wonderful treat for those of us who who uh, have this kind of passion for the field. We also provide certifications, and and this is perhaps the um, uh, the most prominent way that AMS uh, is is um, uh, presented ar uh, around the country. Uh, you see lots of the folks uh, on TV will have an AMS after their name when they're doing the presentation on the uh, local news. Uh, and, and we are the organization uh, that certifies those people if they meet the requirements uh, for that certification. So the, um, uh, the, the gold uh, AMS seal that you see there, that's a certified broadcast meteorologist uh, designation. Um, that's sort of our gold standard. Uh, for broadcasters, uh, the folks you see on TV uh, who have that after their name uh, have met a pretty rigorous um, set of criteria for their educational background. They have uh, presented recordings of uh, presentations that they have done that have been uh, reviewed and graded by a, a volunteer committee of broadcast specialists uh, and have, have been shown to meet uh, a really stringent set of requirements uh, in order to be able to maintain that certification. Uh, similarly, we, we certify consulting meteorologists, and those are folks who may be doing uh, uh, all kinds of consulting. They may uh, come in to help uh, situations where somebody's building a, uh, a large power plant or something to handle the meteorology associated with that. Uh, they may testify in court cases having to do with weather issues, all those sorts of things um, that, that are done by consultants. Um, the uh, the certified consulting meteorologist uh, designation uh, shows that they have met uh, again a minimum set of um, educational background requirements and experience background so that uh, they're well qualified to, to take on that role. We do these certifications because it, it provides a mechanism for the public to know that they're getting trust, uh, trusted information, that, that the individuals who have these certifications are ones that, that have the right kind of background, that they can be trusted by the public. Uh, and we also, um, for, for the individuals to maintain these certifications, they have to continue their education. So they have to be doing professional development activities uh, continuously or else they lose the certification. So you can also trust someone who has uh, the AMS um, seal after their name because that means they have um, uh, not just met the criteria to begin with, but are maintaining 
that level of education and, and maintaining a currency with the field uh, that allows um, uh, them to uh, really uh, be providing uh, uh, useful and trustable, uh, trustful information. Uh, on the very lower right hand, there's a there's a lowercase AMS. It's in black and white. Uh, that was the original AMS seal of approval for broadcasters. You still see lots of folks on TV who will display that particular seal. Uh, that is the um, sort of the old version uh, of our certification. Uh, the criteria was not quite as stringent uh, as it is now, and so. Um, there are uh, folks who can maintain that one and, and certainly have, have, have obtained that certification and, and again shows a, a level of educational background and experience that is um, uh, greater than uh, folks who do not have that certification. But the gold uh, AMS is really the one that, um, uh, that is available now and that shows a higher level of, um, of background both in terms of education and experience. So, so that really is the gold uh, standard at this point. We do a lot of programs for students, uh, and so uh, we really, uh, again, are, as an organization, trying to make sure that the next generation of professionals that enter our field uh, are, are um, well-educated and, and have the right kind of background to succeed. Uh, we do this in lots of different ways. Uh, we, as an organization, provide guidance to universities on what the coursework for meteorology should be, uh, and so we actually have a, a set of curriculum standards that uh, that we promote to universities offering meteorology degrees, uh, and we maintain those by reviewing them uh, on a, a, a nearly continuous basis, but coming out with a new set of, of uh, specifications about every five years, so that um, so that the programs can always be uh, doing things in the way that's the, that's the best possible way for uh, the, for the science itself. So that's one aspect of what we do for students, is making sure that they're going to get the right kinds of courses from the universities that they attend. Uh, we also provide direct support to uh, many students uh, each year in the form of scholarships and fellowships. Uh, we actually provide nearly a half a million dollars a year to students, which is um, really kind of an extraordinary amount, uh, given an organization our size and a field that's as small as meteorology is. Uh, but we have many scholarships and fellowships that are awarded annually. Uh, for students who are, um, you know, terrific uh, students academically uh, and have done, um, you know, good good things that that deserve to be recognized. So those scholarships and fellowships really uh, provide that kind of support for them as they continue uh, their academic uh, career. And then we try to make sure that they will have a smooth transition from uh, their academic career into their professional career. So uh, we provide travel grants uh, for students to go to meetings, both the annual meeting and some of these other meetings that happen over the course of the year, because that's a great way for them to become part of the community, to network with other scientists and professionals, uh, and really smooth that transition. From, from student to professional. Uh, and then we have a, a lot of other programs for them as well to try and help, um, help them find jobs and, and um, uh, do well in terms of creating resumes and, and interviews and all those sorts of things that, um, uh, that help you make that transition from student to professional. So an awful lot of, of the work we do and a lot of the energy that we put into uh, uh, our support for, for things within the society is really directed towards students because uh, all of us recognize that you know that they are the next generation of us, uh, and so uh, we want to make sure that they are are uh, well educated. Uh, they have their background that they need to do uh, well, and that they can uh, succeed uh, as professionals as they move forward in their careers. Um, we also have uh, programs that that work directly with uh, policymakers, and this is a uh, an, an area where uh, we have been increasing, I think, our efforts uh, in trying to engage scientists directly in the policy process. So uh, we do this in a variety of ways. Our, our goal is to make sure that the best possible science is being used when policy is created, uh, and also that uh, the policymakers understand uh, what we as scientists can bring to that discussion. And so uh, we, again, we do this in a variety of ways. One is we, we go directly to the policymakers themselves. Uh, we talk to people on Capitol Hill. We provide briefings for them on scientific issues, um, all the kinds of things that you might expect uh, an organization like us to do uh, uh, for climate change, for um, air pollution issues, for water uh, quality issues, uh, 
uh, for agriculture. Um, those are the kinds of things that, that we worry about because meteorology and, and the related sciences all impact those areas. And we want to make sure that, that the people making uh, new legislation recognize that there's a lot of good science that, that can uh, be used in making sure that those policies are, are, are the best possible ones for the country. We also tried to get the scientists themselves to, to engage more directly. So, um, uh, for example, one of the things that we have uh, is we support uh, having a scientist come uh, to Capitol Hill each year and actually work directly in a uh, congressman or senator's office uh, as a science advisor. Uh, so we, we support that as a congressional fellow, uh, uh, and those folks uh, work for a year on Capitol Hill um, providing uh, scientific support within a, an actual congressional office uh, and, and allowing both the, the scientists to understand the process better and become better engaged in that process, but also so that good science, again, gets into uh, the hands of the policymakers directly. Um, we, we, in addition to that, we also bring for a 10-day period each summer uh, about 30 to 40 uh, scientists uh, onto Capitol Hill and, and do an intensive training process. So the, the, the picture you see there, that group that's in front of uh, the Capitol building, uh, that's the, uh, the group that we brought in uh, a summer or two ago. I can't remember if it was last summer or the one before that that this group was in. Um, and all of those folks spent 10 days uh, in, in a an intense immersive training on the on the policy process and how they can engage better in it because if we can get the scientists to understand that process better then we can uh, expect those scientists to, to talk to their uh, individual congressmen or senators um, to make sure that issues that are important to the scientific community are raised uh, with people who can do something about it. So it's, it's a great way to, um, to teach the scientists to, uh, how to engage more effectively so that the voice can be heard more effectively as well. And lastly, um, uh, we do policy studies. So these are uh, not um, uh, not trying to promote a particular solution, but rather looking at the kinds of options that might be available. And so, for example, we have done um, uh, studies that uh, deal with how climate impacts the financial markets. Uh, and understanding that process better means that when people are creating uh, policies associated with the financial markets, they can understand the, the kinds of impacts that, uh, that, that climate change can have on those. Uh, we've looked at um, issues in terms of um, researched operations, um, uh, the, the transportation industry and how uh, weather affects transportation and how there can be policy processes that, uh, that can improve upon uh, transportation issues by taking into account weather. So all of those kinds of things are, are areas where there's an intersection between policies that are being created and weather, water, or climate issues uh, that we have expertise in. And so we try to make sure that that expertise is available uh, to the policymakers. So, so those were some of the things that we do as an organization that really that, that uh, support uh, the professionals and uh, provide that uh, opportunity for engagement uh, for the professionals. Um, and so let me just uh, pause here for a minute and talk about our membership itself. Uh, as I had in a slide at the very beginning, we have about 13,000 members. Uh, that's not all the meteorologists in the country, but it's a pretty healthy fraction of them. Uh, we would love to have all of them be AMS members, but, but not all of them are, of course. Uh, and then, uh, but within that 13,000, it's not just meteorologists. We have oceanographers, hydrologists, uh, engineers, uh, technicians of various sorts. Even social scientists who um, are working in areas related to, um, uh, say, uh, well, severe weather warnings and, and how to get uh, the public to uh, to better respond to those, uh, all those kinds of issues that, that, that again, end up intersecting uh, the atmosphere in one way or another, all those folks are, are very much welcome as uh, professional members of the AMS. Uh, and we, um, uh, you know, we try to, to have a lot of our programs really um, uh, kind of pertain to, to, to that professional field. Uh, it's interesting that about a third of our membership uh, are academic researchers working in universities, uh, about a third are government employees, uh, not just for the National Weather Service, but for all the different uh, government agencies, uh, and about a third are professionals who work in the private sector, and those can be 
uh, anything from the broadcast meteorologists who are working at private companies to uh, forecasting companies like AccuWeather and some of the other professionals, uh, professional um, uh, forecasting companies, uh, to uh, companies that are uh, building satellites like uh, Lockheed Martin or or some of the um, uh, uh, companies that uh, that provide consulting services to agriculture to people that are building those sorts of things so so again a pretty evenly spread mix between uh, the research scientists government uh, employees that that are doing a variety of things uh, and and professionals across a pretty broad range of, of um, activities within the atmospheric and related sciences we also have uh, a group of our membership, which are, are weather enthusiasts or, or folks who just uh, are not professionals in the field, um, but still have a love for the weather, uh, still want to be engaged with the, the IMS because they do care about the weather and they want to um, keep up with uh, the latest science that's going on. Uh, we really welcome uh, those folks uh, and, and really like having um, uh, kind of the the vibrancy that they bring to the AMS as members uh, and those call, fall into the category that we call associate member uh, so again most of our membership are, are professionals working in the field uh, but associate members are, are often people who uh, are in other uh, career paths or other professions uh, with that love of the weather and so they've um, uh, chosen to be to be members of AMS uh, we offer some great things for those folks uh, they can get the bulletin which again is a, a terrific publication uh, in its own right uh, if they like instead of the bulletin they can get weatherwise magazine and I, I i'm guessing many of you are familiar with weatherwise it's an outstanding publication uh, it's not an ams publication but it's one that um, uh, that all of us i think in, in the weather community um, uh, really enjoy and, and very many of us subscribe to i've i've actually subscribed to weatherwise since i was in high school uh, and, and have maintained that subscription throughout my career. Uh, it's just a, a fun uh, magazine. It's full of great information. Um, uh, many of the people who write for Weatherwise are AMS members and, and, and are part of the AMS community, um, but uh, Weatherwise is an opportunity to share uh, the science with people who are not uh, practicing scientists. Uh, it is geared a little more toward, um, uh, toward a general audience uh, than um, uh, than the bulletin uh, is, but it's a um, uh, again just a terrific publication. So, so uh, associate members uh, can choose either uh, the bulletin or BAMS uh, or Weatherwise as their uh, kind of member publication that comes with their dues, uh, or they can get uh, the bulletin uh, and then also subscribe to Weatherwise at a discount. So. Um, and that's what I do is I subscribe to both uh, the bulletin and weatherwise uh, and and really enjoy getting both of those but um, again I've just got a few uh, cover shots of weatherwise on this slide to give you a sense of the sorts of things uh, that weatherwise covers they do a photo contest contest every year that is just um, uh, just incredible the, the the quality of the photography that's in there and it's uh, it, that's that's my favorite issue every year uh, is the one that has all the photos and because they show not just the winners of the photo contest but uh, but lots of the people who were or runners up or or honorable mentions that um, uh, so you get to see lots of just really outstanding photography in that so that's a little bit about membership in AMS. Keith, well, we're gonna we're gonna keep up on our on the website how you can become an associate member. So we, we're, our message of the day right now is promoting that. We'll keep that up through the weekend, and then also on the page for this talk on our our Weather Talk webinar series, we'll also have a link. So if any of you guys are interested in joining the AMS as an associate member, uh, which I really uh, encourage you to do, we'll have that up there. So just just uh, to be aware of that. Oh, that's terrific. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. Um, I also wanted to spend a little time now also talking about what we do that goes beyond just supporting the professionals. Because while as an organization that's a scientific and professional society, our, our kind of fundamental and core mission is, is providing that service to the professionals in the field, AMS has chosen uh, over many years to, to go beyond that uh, and to do things that, um, uh, that that are not typical perhaps in some ways to organizations like us, uh, but that really provide additional service to the nation. And, and so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. The, the first thing that we, that we uh, do that I think uh, is quite unusual uh, for an organization like us is what we call our K through 13 program. 
Uh, and the K through 13 throws people a little bit. Lots of people are used to hearing K through 12 uh, as meaning kindergarten through uh, 12th grade that pre-college uh, level, uh, and we do a lot of great things for that. The 13 part of it for us uh, is that we also do things for um, students at the college level, but at the sort of introductory college level. So the 13 is sort of thinking in terms of that first year or two of college, and we have some programs that are geared a little bit more specifically to that. On the K through 12 part, uh, the way we do that is is uh, really kind of interesting. What we're what we do is we train the teachers. And so we have uh, several programs that have been around for uh, well over two decades that provide specific in-service training for teachers to, to help them be better science teachers. So we're not doing this specifically to have them teach meteorology or to create the next generation of meteorologists. We really are trying to do this so that science education in our schools is better. And, and that, those training programs uh, do concentrate on weather, climate, oceanography, uh, some uh, on a hydrologic cycle, uh, those kinds of uh, subject areas, because of course that's, those are the areas that we have the expertise. Um, but our hope is that the teachers who take that uh, can use weather, climate, oceanography, those kinds of subjects as ways to teach the scientific process, as ways to teach the scientific method, uh, and, and again, just to, to have um, science be a, a more vibrant, uh, a more relatable kind of subject uh, within the school systems and have the teachers be more comfortable uh, teaching um, in these subject areas uh, so, that, so that, again, that their classes are, are ones that are um, uh, more energetic, more exciting for the students and therefore uh, really help um, uh, promote science literacy. Uh, ac across the country. Um, to say these programs have been in place for, uh, for uh, many years, uh, we have now trained uh, tens of thousands of teachers directly, uh, and many of those teachers go back and do workshops uh, within their schools of their colleague teachers as well. So, so the tens of thousands of teachers that we've uh, trained um, uh, very directly actually translate to hundreds of thousands of teachers that have been trained in one way or another through these AMS programs. And of course, uh, that translates to millions of students uh, who have been impacted by these programs. Uh, I, I just, I get so excited talking about the things we're doing with teachers and it's so much fun. Uh, to interact with the teachers that are part of these programs because they're so energetic. Uh, they love what they do. Uh, they love taking the, uh, the things that they learn uh, in these programs uh, back to their classrooms and, and finding ways to, uh, to really kind of spice up uh, their science teaching in, in innovative ways. Uh, it really is just a lot of fun. Uh, to interact with these people. And, and for many of these teachers, we provide them uh, just outstanding opportunities to do things that they wouldn't otherwise get a chance to do. Uh, there's, uh, there, we've had groups of teachers coming in each year uh, for one set of workshops that actually get to go and look at and, and kind of uh, explore and, and, and play with things like ice cores that are, that are maintained in, in uh, special um, locations uh, by the government. Uh, you know, things that, that most people don't get a chance to see. Uh, they've gone into the Severe Storms Lab and, and, and seen how those forecasts are made, all kinds of, of really sort of behind the scenes things that show how the science is used and how the science translates to service for uh, the, the general public. And, and again, I think that those kind of very hands-on activities give them an opportunity to, uh, you know, to take that energy and that enthusiasm back to their classrooms and, and it really um, uh, translates to some exciting things happening uh, for all of our kids. It's, it's, you know, there's so many um, uh, folks around the country whose kids have been impacted by these programs may never have heard of, a, heard of AMS as an organization and yet um, uh, things that we have been doing uh, as an organization with the, the teachers that they're having uh, really have had an impact on, on their educational process. So that part of it is the K through 12, uh, just outstanding stuff. The, the, the 13 part uh, is providing distance learning courses for uh, college students uh, in uh, weather, climate, oceanography, again, these, these basic subject areas that we have expertise, uh, in colleges that normally couldn't offer those kinds of courses. And so we have a, a set of programs that allow a, a community college or a smaller university or a college that does not have somebody on the faculty who can 
teach these courses, to offer these courses through the university. Uh, we provide them as a distance learning course, and, uh, and that allows that uh, uh, community college or college or university to have a course on the books in, in weather and climate or oceanography or, again, one of these um, subject areas. Um, that improves the environmental literacy of their students, uh, provides a, uh, a science course for non-science majors that, um, that really gets our science uh, into the hands of these students. Um, a, a particularly exciting aspect of this is that many of the uh, colleges that uh, focus on serving minority um, uh, students, the, um, uh, the minority serving institutions around the country, uh, tend to be smaller. Uh, they then have uh, uh, smaller science faculties uh, and, and in many cases have been uh, colleges that have not had an opportunity to have on faculty somebody who could, who could teach a weather and climate type course. Uh, so these um, distance learning courses that AMS provides through these colleges uh, in many cases are the first time they have ever been able to offer a course in, in weather or climate. Uh, and, and that's an exciting opportunity for those students. Uh, we have over 100 minority serving institutions who are now offering courses that are provided by AMS. Uh, and so again, it's, it's a, whole, um, a whole population of students who uh, prior to this didn't even have an option to take a course uh, that covered these subject areas uh, and now have that as a, um, as, as a regular part of the uh, curriculum that's available at their schools. So we're really excited about these programs. Uh, it again is an opportunity for us to improve the science literacy uh, around the country. Uh, again, we're not trying to, to create more meteorologists out of these programs. We're really just trying to have uh, a larger percentage of the population understand how the atmosphere works, uh, understand issues about climate and climate change, uh, understand the connections between the oceans uh, and, and their lives, uh, all these sorts of things where the science um, uh, really is is uh, impactful uh, to the population in ways that um, uh, wouldn't otherwise be so obvious to some folks unless they had taken these courses. So wonderful programs happening there. Uh, another area where we do some things that I think are, are really impactful is uh, by issuing statements. Uh, the AMS uh, will put out official policy and position statements uh, from time to time uh, on topics, and those become uh, really important documents. They're, they're usually a couple of pages long. Uh, they will take a particular topic and they'll offer the AMS position on that topic. Uh, so, you know, climate change is, of course, a really big one. Uh, climate change issue is one that's become very politicized. And so having a statement that carries the full weight of the scientific community behind it uh, really is, is an important thing. And so uh, AMS spends a lot of time and a lot of energy working on these to make sure that the science is exactly correct in these uh, statements, that it really represents the, the position of uh, the, the, that's uh, uh, kind of serving the scientific community and that, that represents uh, you know, the, the sort of the best possible information for the public. Uh, so climate change is obviously one of those. Uh, we also have statements uh, that deal with uh, STEM education. STEM is um, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, uh, and so those areas that are that are more science-related areas, uh, and and the kinds of of issues that uh, that we want to make sure that um, uh, educators are aware of are part of that that statement. Uh, we do statements on the observational needs for our community to make sure that uh, that that government agencies are aware of how important certain observational platforms might be, whether it's satellites or or radars or, or um, some of the, the perhaps less um, uh, flashy uh, types of observational uh, networks uh, so that so that, th that importance is really magnified. Um, and then we do statements on, on uh, you know, issues of tornado safety, lightning safety, uh, again, things that are really directed to the public so that they have the best possible information. Um, so again, these statements are ones that are uh, really our community, that is the, the meteorological and, and related sciences community, making sure that the best possible information is available uh, to the general public, to policymakers, to, uh, to folks who need this kind of information. Uh, and so it really is, um, again, a service that we're providing in a sense, um, but it's one that, um, uh, that offers us a, an opportunity to, to get the best possible information out there. 
And, and another area where we do things which is sort of related to that, um, but has taken a, a little bit of a different character over recent years, is really trying to uh, defend scientific integrity. Uh, we find more and more these days that um, uh, it, it seems easier for people to dismiss the science than it used to. Uh, we find that uh, as the uh, internet has grown and as um, uh, you know, sort of this sort of fake news uh, kind of issue has grown, uh, that um, uh, people sometimes forget that you know the science does provide uh, you know a, a mechanism for finding the truth. Uh, it provides a uh, an opportunity to. Um, to have testable hypotheses and understand what's going on. And so we try to make sure that uh, when policymakers are making statements or doing things that they're using the best available science, that they're saying things that are correct. Uh, and when uh, other uh, things happen that, that uh, sort of uh, uh, impinge upon the scientific process or, or, or um, uh, you know, attack the scientific process, uh, that we as an organization, uh, you know, take the opportunity to stand up for science and say that science really is, is an important part of, uh, of how we find out how things really work. So, so that aspect of what we do, as I say, is one that, that actually has increased over the last few years, um, but has become, I, I think, a very important role uh, for organizations like AMS to play, and we're certainly not the only organization that's doing this, um, but it's um, it's one where uh, where we're taking very seriously the the need to to actually defend science. And just to give a couple of examples, uh, I've got a couple of um, uh, sort of images from the Washington Post. Um, there, uh, we there have been situations where. Uh, the, the chairman of the uh, House Science Committee uh, has uh, worked to try to attack and undermine uh, the, the work of some scientists, in particular some scientists within NOAA. Uh, we really worked hard as an organization to um, uh, try to defend uh, that science and, and defend those scientists. Uh, and so we have written letters and, and spent time talking to the House Science Committee uh, to really make it clear that um, you know that that uh, science uh, you know that the scientific process is working the way it should, and that the science uh, really should be taken uh, you know for the, um, uh, the you know for the for the, the the credible process that it is. And so in this particular case, it was uh, a a congressman who was uh, attacking uh, a climate scientists because they didn't like the answer the climate scientists were getting. Uh, we have also defended scientists uh, who are climate skeptics. And so uh, there was a, a similar situation where a, uh, a congressman was, um, uh, w was actually uh, targeting scientists who are not uh, supportive of the consensus view of climate change. Uh, and yet, um, uh, they are working as scientists. They were trying to do the science uh, using using uh, credible scientific processes. Uh, and so, AMS as an organization also uh, stood up to uh, to defend those scientists, um, so that so that uh, you know they could move forward and 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 work through the scientific process correctly. So, we really. Um, uh, are defending science not in a partisan way, not it's not Republican versus Democrat or, or conservative versus liberal. It really is saying that, that science as a process needs to be defended and needs to be uh, taken seriously. So, so that's kind of the, uh, the way we have approached this issue. Uh, and, and, it's, uh, it, and it's one that I'm really very proud of because it, it, it really shows that, that we are just about the science and not about the politics. Uh, more recently, uh, the, um, uh, the director of EPA uh, made some statements that were just scientifically incorrect. Uh, and so again, we, we did our best to, uh, to try to make sure that, uh, that uh, we were standing up on behalf of the science uh, and, were, uh, make, and, and were being clear and, and very visible. That uh, that if uh, you know the head of the EPA makes statements that are scientifically incorrect, that that an organization like AMS uh, will stand up and try and correct the record. Uh, 
So again, it's, it's an opportunity for us to defend the science, uh, to protect uh, the, the scientific process in, in a way that, um, uh, that, we, that we think is a very important process for us to be doing. So sort of summarizing that, uh, I, I hope that we've kind of gone through, well, summarizing that, uh, <laughs> the things that we go beyond just just uh, supporting the professionals. Uh, we really uh, do our best to try and make sure that, that STEM education and, and pre-college science education uh, is, um, uh, is improved uh, by, by uh, working with teachers to, to make them better at teaching science and to improve that scientific uh, education process. Uh, we uh, try to serve as an honest broker of information so that we can be a trusted source uh, on issues related to the atmosphere, oceans, uh, hydrology, those sorts of things, uh, all those all those subject areas that we cover, uh, and we really work hard to defend the integrity of science and the scientific process. So those are areas where, where um, I feel we've gone kind of beyond our core mission of supporting just the professionals, uh, and and really are trying to do some things that um, uh, that really are a service to uh, the the nation and the world beyond that. So I, I hope that that. I've covered kind of three pieces of this. One is is a little bit about what we do to support the professionals in the field. Uh, the second is is how, as an organization, we welcome more than just professionals uh, as part of AMS, and we would love to have uh, many more associate members uh, who are perhaps not working directly in the atmospheric and related sciences, but that care about the atmospheric and related sciences and uh, want to, to uh, be part of the AMS community to support those. Uh, and third, uh, that, um, that we go beyond those, those um, core functions uh, to really provide services uh, to the broader public in, in really important ways. So before I open up for questions, I just will make one more invitation uh, to all of you, and that is uh, AMS is headquartered in Boston. Uh, uh, Henry mentioned that right at the uh, outset. Uh, we are in a terrific uh, historic building uh, that's uh, a little over 200 years old. Uh, it is a, um, uh, it's, it's a, a terrific example of what's called a Georgian mansion. Uh, it was the uh, home of Harrison Gray Otis when he was the mayor of Boston. And uh, it's a, um, a spectacular uh, example of that uh, uh, early 1800 kind of architecture that's been preserved uh, beautifully uh, over the years um, uh, before AMS has uh, obtained the building, but also uh, we've worked very hard in the last 50 years that we've been here to, um, to make sure that we, that we preserve the building um, beautifully as well. Any of you who are in Boston uh, for any reason at all uh, and are there on a weekday, uh, oh, I certainly hope you would stop by. Uh, we love to give tours of the house. We have people that, that, that wander in um, uh, just because they're walking by and, they, and they, they're wondering who we are. Uh, and, and we give tours to those folks. Um, but, um, but especially people uh, who uh, care about the, the atmosphere, who are uh, interested in, in the work that we do, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a neat place to see. Uh, it's, it's a fun uh, kind of history lesson in a lot of ways. There's some, some really wonderful things that are part of the history of this building. Uh, and so again, for all of you that are on the call, uh, if you find yourself in Boston on a weekday uh, and, uh, and you want to stop by, we would love to have you come in and, uh, and we would love to give you a tour of the building and, and tell you a little bit more about AMS and, and what we do there. So with that, um, I will uh, uh, transfer back to, uh, to, to Henry to, uh, to take questions you might have. Uh, my email address is there in red. Uh, our website address is there in red uh, just below that. Uh, so certainly um, I, I'm happy to take email questions from any of you uh, at a later time um, uh, and, and always enjoy uh, chatting with folks who are interested in the weather. Uh, but um, uh, you know, for now, let's uh, take whatever questions you might have uh, online. Thanks so much, Keith. Wow, what a, what a, a great presentation, very comprehensive uh, things that you folks may not have known about the AMS. You've heard of the AMS before, but uh, we really uh, appreciate your time going into depth on that. And uh, you know the building there, um, so if you do go to Boston and you're, you get off at the Boston Common, they're right there. In fact, if you're, a lot of people come by the building thinking, oh, is this where Cheers is? At the old TV show, uh, and that's down the street a little bit, so not too far from there. If you do wander into Cheers, 
just head back towards the State House, the Capitol building, and you'll see the AMS headquarters here. Great building. They have a carriage house out back that was not in the picture, and they've renovated that. Uh, the publications uh, department is out there. I think they're still out there, Keith. I uh, yes, haven't been there in right. a while. But it's, it's just a beautiful building to tour, uh, some some great stuff in there. And what a great place. I, I got the privilege to work there for, for six years in that building, and it is, uh, it is great. And a lot of good food around there, too, so bring your appetites when you, when you get to that area. Well, we're going to take questions um, for the next uh, uh, couple minutes or so. Uh, and so if you want to type in your question, we'll do our best and uh, we'll to answer, or Keith will do his best to answer those. If we don't have enough time to cover them all today, He'll follow up with a quick email afterwards. And we will have this presentation recorded as well as Keith's slides here if you want to go back over those on our website later this week. So we'll, we'll look at that. And then there's on the on the, the uh, page right there, there's the uh, AMS web page and then also Keith's email. So here we go. And uh, one of our first questions is coming in from Bill. And Bill wants to know, how do I access AMS statements? Can I be alerted via email of new statements? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, accessing the existing statements is pretty easy. When you go to the AMS website, uh, there's actually a couple of ways to get there. The easiest one, the way that I always go, uh, is on the website um, uh, near the top, there's a, a link that says About. Uh, and under that About AMS link uh, is uh, one that goes directly to the AMS statements page. And so you can view all the statements that are in force, uh, meaning that they're considered uh, the active positions for the society uh, and on that page. Uh, in terms of being alerted uh, to new statements, uh, new statements are published in the bulletin, so uh, AMS members are, are alerted uh, uh, that, that way uh, in particular that, that uh, the statement actually show up in an issue of, of the bulletin. Um, they, they're also for AMS members uh, are, is a, an email specific to the members that goes out about new statements. Uh, but the other way, if you're not a member and you still want to get that information, uh, we have a, a newsletter, a monthly newsletter called Soundings, uh, and that is available. You can subscribe to that whether you're a member or not. And so again, on the website, um, uh, there will be a link to Soundings. And part of uh, what you can do when you go on that link is sign up to obtain soundings. And that's actually just a nice, um, uh, as I say, it's a monthly kind of email newsletter uh, that tells you uh, upcoming meetings, uh, some, you know, interesting facts, of, you know, that, that are cropping up um, related to AMS. But uh, whenever there's a new statement, it will uh, be announced as part of soundings. Thanks, Keith. Here's one from Tommy in Staunton, Virginia. And he is a high school homeschooler, and he was wondering uh, how he could join the AMS. How, what would he would join as? Would that be associate member? How would he do that? Yes, that would be an associate member. Um, and uh, and again, on a website, if you go to membership, there's uh, an opportunity to um, uh, to go through the, the application process for that. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but associate member would be the right the right level for that. And Tommy, if you go to our message of the day today, you'll see the links on there. And again, we'll post those on, on the Weather Talk uh, webinar page that deals with this particular AMS topic. So we'll have that on there for you. So we still have time for any questions. Anybody wants to write in? I've got a couple for you. Um, so um, the uh, the meetings, the, the, the uh, conferences that are around, are those open to the public or would that be just for members? So could somebody... Uh, attend a uh, an AMS the annual meeting or one of the broadcast meetings or how does that work? It, they are open to more than just members, uh, and we do have uh, non AMS members attending uh, the AMS meetings pretty routinely. The um, I guess I guess I would say depending on on your uh, interest level and and sort of um, uh, knowledge level, some of the meetings will be more fun than others. Uh, the annual meeting is is pretty neat uh, just because it's got such a collection of uh, different topics and and at any given time there are about um, uh, anywhere from twenty to twenty five uh, concurrent sessions operating and so there's something that's that's interesting to almost anybody 
uh, over the course of that meeting. Plus, the the annual meeting has a really large exhibits program that <clears throat> that has displays by you know the people making satellites and radars and and all the really cool uh, equipment as well as um, people that are doing a lot of other great um, kinds of services and products. Um, so that one you know it certainly is uh, is available. Uh, the meeting uh, registrations. Uh, uh, cost about five hundred dollars, and so they're not uh, inexpensive to go to, uh, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. But um, but certainly they're they're available, uh, and and um, uh, anyone who would would like to go to one of the meetings certainly is is welcome to do that. Uh, some of the meetings, especially those smaller ones that are happening um, on their own, uh, can be very very technical, and so in a lot of cases. Um, uh, even somebody like me that has uh, a PhD in meteorology, uh, uh, there are certain meetings, if I go to them, I'm not understanding a whole lot of what I'm seeing because it's it's the cutting edge science in a very uh, narrowly defined field. So some would not be that enjoyable to somebody who wasn't really a specialist in that area. Um, but again, the annual meeting is, has a very wide range of topics. Um, uh, some of the meetings like the broadcast meteorologist meeting, uh, is is one where there's uh, quite a number of terrific presentations uh, for the broadcasters on a variety of issues uh, that um, uh, that I think lots of people who are uh, have enough interest uh, in meteorology to really be following it closely would find things that they would enjoy. And also at the annual meeting, uh, I don't know if we're, we'll be do, you'll be doing this this year. Weatherfest is something oh, yeah. mm -hmm. that's open to the public. Um, it's it's really great. There's there's all kinds of interactive things. It's usually this Sunday before the meeting begins. Uh, this year it'll be in Austin, Texas, in in January. So if you guys are in that area, and then eventually, I think maybe the year after, is it nineteen that we're coming to Boston? Um, it's it's actually 2020. We'll be in Boston. 2020. Uh, okay. okay. Yes, that's our hundredth annual meeting. So that's the that'll be a big celebration for the our, our uh, completing a hundred years as an organization. Uh, but you're right. You're right, Henry. And the Weatherfest um, uh, event is uh, is open to the public. It's free. Uh, it's terrific. Uh, uh, Coco Ross has been there a number of times doing some really fun games for for people who want to come in. It's a great family event. Uh, and so if the annual meeting happens to be uh, somewhere near uh, where you're, you're uh, living as, as one of the participants on this call, uh, certainly that's something that I think is worth looking into is, is coming for that uh, four-hour uh, event on that Sunday afternoon. It's just a lot of fun for families. And that's free. There's no charge to, to go to the Weatherfest, right? It, it's that's, been, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so there's no charge for that. Uh, you know, something, Keith, I wanted to just touch on. Uh, I noticed you may have mentioned it. Uh, AMS puts a lot of books out. So there's some terrific books and publications as far as um, different subjects in, in weather. I've got a bunch of them on my shelf here, which uh, you've got Northeast snowstorms, and uh, some more technical stuff like that. But if you go to the AMS website, there's a, a really nice, uh, nice group of books you can order, and uh, by, and uh, you might find those of interest as well. Yeah, exactly. They're they're really good. And one we one that just came out recently that I just read uh, that I just loved <laughs> is called Weather in the Courtroom, uh, oh. and it's uh, it, it's by Bill Haggard, who I think you know, uh, you Henry. Bet. Sure, sure. Uh, and he has done. He was the uh, expert witness for uh, a lot of very high profile cases that had weather involved, uh, some aircraft accidents. Um, uh, a couple of uh, cases of um, uh, 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 ships uh, running into things in, in fog, those sorts of things. Uh, and he just, he has, and so he wrote a book uh, about some of the most interesting cases that he was an expert witness on. I was, I just couldn't put it down. It was such a fascinating uh, collection. He's a great writer, uh, it's a wonderful individual in, in general, but, um, um, but, but that's one we just published within the last year. Uh, and and again, is one of one of my um, uh, new favorites. Uh, and I've been telling everybody I meet that they that they should get this book and read it because it's just it really is good. It's really neat. It shows and it shows the impact that weather has uh, on uh, in ways that that you may not think about until you uh, kind of see that there's a lot of the you know the high profile cases where weather has played a role uh, and. Um, uh, and, and a lot of times the, the verdict, uh, or in, I mean that in the sense of finding the truth in a situation, uh, has really hinged on having somebody that understood the weather well enough 
uh, to be able to come in and, and decipher the evidence in a way that, uh, that pointed toward uh, what actually happened. Yeah, so if, if, you have, if you're at the beach this summer and you're looking for something to read, there you go. You've got uh, yeah. a, 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 a great book to bring along. Okay, we're getting a couple more questions in here. Um, actually, the, the, Tommy wanted to know, the, the, the student, uh, how he would go about applying for a scholarship from the AMS. So is that something you can do online? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's available online, um, and, and we've got scholarships at various points of, of their career. So uh, we have a, a collection of scholarships that are available to um, students as they would be entering as freshmen undergraduates, and so those would be applied for during your senior year in high school. Uh, then we also have scholarships um, uh, for students during their undergraduate careers, that, so some that you would look, uh, look for when you're a sophomore. Uh, some that you would look for when you're a junior, and then even uh, even for later, if you're going on to graduate school, uh, we have a collection of graduate fellowships. So each of those uh, is has a different application process, of course, uh, and but all of them are available on the AMS website. There's a, a whole section that has uh, kind of resources for students, and the, and the scholarships and fellowships are part of that page. And you know, if you're a student, I remember back when I was, uh, I uh, had a chance to be a student volunteer at AMS meetings. And I, I think they're still doing that where yep. you can work AV or work registration and they help you to, to go to the meeting. And it was great. I met people that, wow, all these legends in the field and I'm actually talking to these guys as, as they're, they're, they're registering for the meetings. And so, wow, it, as a student, it's, it's kind of a neat opportunity to, to get to the meeting and uh, and participate, so that's something to think about as well. Yeah, that that really is a great program. We um, we help support about a hundred students to go to the annual meeting every year, uh, and most of them are, are doing as you say, Henry. They're they're helping us, and so we ask for a, a few hours a day of them helping us, and then in return we give them a hotel room and and registration for the meeting and and uh, a little bit of cash to cover food while they're there. Uh, so uh, it, it's a great opportunity, and and the students. Um, I uh, get so much out of that in terms of, of getting a chance to network with other students, uh, meet some of, the, some of the really, as you say, some of the leaders of the field, the, the, the greats in the field. Uh, it, it's, it's really uh, an, an incredible opportunity for them. I remember working at the broadcast when I was like, wow, it's kind of like being among all these baseball players. So, oh, I know this guy. I've seen it. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, here's Travis. Uh, uh, Travis of Minnesota wants to know, how can a person contribute to the AMS scholarship fund? So is there a way that folks can give money to help support these scholarships? There, boy, there absolutely is, and, and, and what a great, uh, a, a great thing to donate to. Uh, uh, on the AMS website, again, um, if you go to there, there's a, a donate button. Uh, if you click on that, and uh, we're happy to to have you use a credit card to provide some funding, and you can designate that specifically for students, uh, and that is uh, uh, far and away the uh, the largest um, uh, area that we get donations for is for our student programs. Um, but again, it's it's an area where we do so much stuff for students, and how much we do is is limited only by how much uh, resources we have available for that. So if 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 we get more donations, we get to do more stuff. Uh, more students get in, uh, get uh, supported, so uh, that's a that's a terrific uh, opportunity. And I will say, you know, this is uh, again something we do um, as an organization. Uh, every dollar that we get uh, donated for students goes to the students. Uh, we don't um, we absorb all the administrative costs directly. So uh, if somebody gives us a hundred dollars to help uh, fund uh, student travel grants, that hundred dollars goes fully to the students uh, under that travel grant program. Here's here's a question from Kathleen, and Kathleen wants to know she's she participates in Kokoros and is also a master naturalist. She was wondering if the AMS participates at all with master naturalists. Is there a you guys have a a, 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 a relationship there? We don't, but boy, that sounds like something we ought to pursue. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, Kathleen could could email me more information about that, and and I could. Um, uh, learn more myself so that we could find out if there's ways that we can connect more effectively. That would be great. Yeah, yeah I know the Master Naturalist and the Master Gardener uh, community is, is really big with Kokoros, and so that, yeah, that would be a really natural fit. So really uh, we've got, there's Keith's email uh, address right up there on the, on the screen right now, so if you want to shoot him a quick email, that would be great. 
Uh, Cindy writes in, and she's wondering what kind of reactions you've gotten from letters you've written to Congress members um, with their, their recent statements and so forth. Uh, it's been a mix. Uh, we've had some really good discussion with uh, some of the staff uh, in those uh, congressional offices, uh, and I think um, uh, I think we've had a real impact. Uh, so so certainly, I think there's uh, there's been some real good that's come from those letters. Uh, in a couple of cases, uh, you get the sense that the letter's been ignored, uh, and and that's always unfortunate when that happens. But I suppose not, uh, uh, you know. Not a huge surprise in some cases, but but actually, um, I've been very um, uh, impressed uh, that, that when we send one of these letters, it's uh, pretty common for uh, for staff members within that office to reach out to us, uh, and we've had uh, we've ended up uh, going to Washington and going into their offices and spending quite a bit of time with them uh, to go over some of these things. And I think they've actually heard what it is we're saying, and and uh, while in this political climate, it it, it may not be that. Um, that you see a lot of things change. I think, uh, I think we have had an impact on that dialogue, and and I think there are actually are some some very tangible things that are being done differently because of what we have done. She was also wondering if, the, if you've had any protesters at, at your meetings. I don't remember seeing anybody at, at many of the meetings. No, um, no, but that does happen at, with different different organizations. So you know, oh, certainly it, 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 it yeah. does, and and uh, you know that's always uh, uh, you know a, a possibility. I think. Um, uh, again, th the positions that we've taken are really based on the peer-reviewed science and, and not on the politics, and so um, it's a little harder to argue with science than it is to argue with politics, I think. And so I, that may be one of the reasons we don't see a lot of active protests going on related to our work, um, because we do concentrate so, so directly on the science itself. Uh, but, uh, but again, it's, it's, it's something that's, that's always a possibility. Well, here's the last question of the day. I know uh, time is running out here. So Lloyd wants to know, that does AMS verify whether underground reports or, or any any reports? I, you guys are not, not not in that field to do that, but... Uh, no, that's right. We don't, no, we don't, uh, we don't verify those. And, and just as, as the people that get our, our certification, so the people with the AMS after their name, uh, that doesn't mean we check on the, the quality of their forecast or the correctness of their forecast. That, that really means that... Uh, they have met met a level of credentials that uh, that show that they know what they're talking about. Um, but no, we we're not uh, in the business of of trying to keep scores of uh, of different people's forecasts, whether it's uh, websites or or individuals. Um, but we do hope that um, uh, you know that everybody uh, tries to do the very best they can, and that the the forecasts that they that they provide are the are based on the highest quality and, and the best possible techniques. Well, Keith, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being with us today and taking time. It's, it's always neat to have a friend, actually, to talk with on these. And so <laughs> I, 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 I really appreciate that time. And hopefully uh, the folks out there will, will follow up on some of these things and, and, and maybe join the AMS, uh, come to some of the meetings. So, again, thank you for taking your That's time. That's great. Out. Great great chatting with you, uh, Henry, and I'm great to have uh, had this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Well, folks, uh, for you, those of you out there, mark your calendars and join us for our next webinar. And that's going to be coming up on July 13th, Thursday, July 13th. Russ Schumacher, Schumacher he's a professor here at uh, CSU in the Atmospheric Sciences. He's going to discuss mesoscale convective systems. And that's uh, that's a really interesting topic. I'm sure he'll have a lot of great graphics and stuff on there. So join us for that one, and uh, you you'll be able to register here in the next week or so uh, for that. So and then finally, when you're signing off today, please take that short survey. It's going to pop up on your screen, and uh, we really appreciate that. So until next month, or actually the month of July, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. This is Henry Regis for the rest of the Kokoros headquarters team saying so long for now and wishing you all a great weekend ahead. Thanks for being with us today. Take care.